In the quiet town of Brembata di Sopra, nestled between the rivers Brembo and Adda in northern Italy, life moved at its own unhurried pace. The picturesque streets lined with poplars and cypresses, and the distant view of the blue-gray peaks of the Bergamo Alps painted a serene picture. But beneath this tranquil facade, in November 2010, a mystery began to unfold that would grip the nation for years to come. Yara Gambirasio, a 13-year-old rhythmic gymnast with train track braces, disappeared without a trace. Her absence sent shockwaves through the community, turning the peaceful town into the epicenter of one of Italy's most intricate and haunting murder investigations. As the case unraveled, it revealed a web of secrets, DNA breakthroughs, and unexpected twists that kept the Italian public on the edge of their seats. But while the investigation and subsequent trial seem to provide answers, the story doesn't end there. Aragambirasio was not just a name that would soon dominate headlines. She was a vibrant young girl with dreams, passions, and a life ahead of her. Born into the Gambirasio family, Yara was the third of four children, nestled between an older sister, Keba, and two younger brothers, Natan and Gioele. The Gambirasio family was well respected in Brembate di Sopra. Yara's father, Fulvio, was an architect with a lineage rooted in the town. His parents had served the community as postmen. Mora, Yara's mother, was a dedicated teacher in Longuelo, a nearby town. Their family was a tight-knit unit, bound by values of love, respect, and honesty. Yara was a budding rhythmic gymnast, a passion she pursued with dedication. Her days were often filled with training sessions, preparing for displays and competitions. The gym was her second home, a place where she not only honed her skills, but also built friendships and memories. The 26th of November 2010 seemed like any other day. Yara had plans to visit her gym, a short distance from her home, to drop off a stereo with her instructor. The rhythmic gymnastics display was just around the corner, scheduled for the following Sunday, and Yara was in high spirits. She bid her family goodbye, assuring them she'd be back soon. Little did they know, it would be the last time they'd see her. As the hours ticked by, Yara's absence became increasingly alarming. By 7 p.m., with no sign of her return and calls going straight to voicemail, anxiety turned to panic. The serene streets of Brembata di Sopra, which had always promised safety, now echoed with a haunting silence. As the evening wore on and Yara remained missing, her family's concern escalated. The Gambirazio household, which was usually filled with the laughter and chatter of four children, was now enveloped in a tense silence. Every passing minute felt like an eternity. By 7.20 p.m., with no word from Yara, her father made the distressing call to the police. The gravity of the situation was immediately recognized. The call was swiftly directed to the public prosecutor's office in Bergamo, the provincial capital located east of Brembata di Sopra. The magistrate on duty, Letizia Ruggeri, a seasoned former policewoman with a history of battling the Cosa Nostra in Sicily, took charge. Understanding the urgency, she dispatched both state police officers and Carabinieri, the military police, to the town. Yara's gym instructor confirmed seeing her earlier that day. She had engaged in light training before leaving. The last known contact with Yara was a text message she sent to a friend, Martina, at 6.44 p.m., making plans to meet the following Sunday. This message became the last trace of her before she vanished. The gym, part of a vast sports complex, had multiple entry and exit points. A few individuals reported seeing two men, possibly conversing with Yara, near a red car. However, these accounts were vague, offering little concrete information. 
In a bid to trace Yara's steps, Ruggeri employed tracker dogs, known for their keen sense of smell. Instead of leading towards Yara's home, the dogs headed in the opposite direction, towards a hamlet called Mapello. Further analysis of Yara's mobile phone signals corroborated this, indicating her phone's presence in Mapello that evening. As days turned into weeks, the mystery of Yara's disappearance captivated the nation. Italian television, dominated by crime news, turned its focus to Brimbate di Sopra. Camera crews and reporters descended upon the town, transforming the Gambiracio's quiet cul-de-sac into a media hotspot. The Gambiracio family, overwhelmed by the sudden media attention, sought solace in their faith. They declined public processions, opting instead for private prayers with the Ursuline Order nuns and a mass in Yara's name. The disappearance of Yara Gambiracio was not just a local tragedy, it became a national obsession. The investigation, led by the determined Letizia Ruggeri, would become one of the most complex and exhaustive in Italian history. As is customary in such investigations, the inquiry began close to home. Every member of the Gambiracio family was questioned, searching for any signs of internal discord or hidden secrets. However, the family's clear distress and consistent accounts quickly ruled out any internal involvement. Among the thousands of phone records analyzed, one particular number stood out. It belonged to a Moroccan man named Mohamed Fikri. A wiretapped conversation seemed to implicate him, leading to his swift arrest. However, this promising lead soon crumbled. The incriminating phrase was found to be mistranslated and Fikri was cleared of any involvement. On the 26th of February 2011, three months after Yara's disappearance, a man stumbled upon a body in the town of Cignolo di Sola. The discovery was heart-wrenching. Amidst tall weeds lay Yara, identified by her black bomber jacket and Hello Kitty sweatshirt. The scene painted a grim picture. Her iPod, house keys and phone SIM card were scattered around, but the phone itself was missing. Conducted by Italy's renowned forensic pathologist, Professor Cristina Cataneo, the autopsy revealed chilling details. Traces of lime were found in Yara's respiratory passages, suggesting a construction-related element. Her clothing bore marks of a sharp weapon, indicating a violent struggle. However, there were no signs of sexual assault. The most significant lead came in the form of DNA evidence. Male DNA was discovered on Yara's underwear, suggesting the murderer might have been injured during the attack. This DNA profile, labeled Ignoto, one or unknown one, became the focal point of the investigation. In an unprecedented move, Ruggeri initiated a mass DNA testing drive. Thousands of men in the region were tested, hoping to find a match to the elusive Ignoto One. This massive undertaking was both a show of investigative determination and a reflection of the community's desperation for answers. The Carabinieri meticulously analyzed phone records, cross-referencing mobile phones that had moved between Brembate di Sopra and Cignolo di Sola on the day of Yara's disappearance. This labor-intensive task aimed to narrow down potential suspects based on their locations. As the investigation progressed, the vast web of DNA samples, phone records and witness testimonies began to converge on one individual, Massimo Giuseppe Bossetti. His emergence as the prime suspect would add another layer of complexity to an already intricate case, sparking debates and controversies that would divide public opinion. Bossetti, a builder by profession, was a seemingly ordinary man. He had a family, worked diligently, and had no significant criminal record. On the surface, he appeared to be just another resident of the region with no apparent connection to Yara or her family. The turning point in the investigation came when Bassetti's DNA was found to match the Ignoto One profile. This discovery was not straightforward. 
It was the result of tracing the DNA of a deceased bus driver, Giuseppe Guerinoni, and subsequently testing his potential relatives. Bossetti, it was revealed, was the illegitimate son of Guerinoni, linking him directly to the DNA found on Yara. Armed with this crucial piece of evidence, authorities arrested Bassetti in June 2014. From the outset, Bassetti vehemently denied any involvement in Yara's murder. He provided alibis, challenged the DNA evidence, and maintained that he had never met Yara. His defense centered on potential errors in the DNA analysis and the possibility of contamination. Bassetti's arrest reignited media interest in the case. His every move, statement, and court appearance was scrutinized and broadcasted. The media painted contrasting images of Bassetti. Some portrayed him as a cold-blooded killer, while others suggested he was a scapegoat, caught up in a flawed investigation. The community was split. Some believed in Bassetti's guilt, citing the undeniable DNA evidence. Others felt he was innocent, a victim of circumstantial evidence and media sensationalism. As the evidence against Bassetti mounted, so did the anticipation for the trial. It promised to be a legal battle of epic proportions, with the weight of DNA science pitted against the intricacies of human memory, alibis, and the ever-present media glare. The courtroom in Bergamo became the stage for a legal drama that would captivate Italy. As Massimo Giuseppe Bossetti stood in the dock, the weight of the nation's gaze bore down on him. The trial was not just about determining his guilt or innocence, it was a reflection of the complexities of modern forensic science, the role of media in shaping public opinion, and the quest for justice in the face of overwhelming odds. Central to the prosecution's case was the DNA evidence linking Bassetti to the crime scene. Experts testified about the accuracy and reliability of the match, emphasizing its significance in identifying Bassetti as the perpetrator. The prosecution presented data showing Bassetti's mobile phone movements on the day of Yara's disappearance, suggesting he was in the vicinity of both her last known location and the site where her body was found. Several witnesses were called to testify, including those who claimed to have seen Yara speaking to two men near a red car on the day she disappeared. While none could definitively identify Bassetti, their testimonies added layers to the prosecution's narrative. Bassetti's defense team mounted a vigorous challenge to the DNA evidence. They argued for the possibility of contamination and raised questions about the handling and storage of samples. Experts were called to highlight the potential pitfalls of relying solely on DNA evidence. The defense presented alibis for Bassetti's whereabouts on the day of Yara's disappearance. They also pointed to the lack of any direct evidence, such as video footage or definitive witness accounts, linking him to the crime. The defense highlighted other potential suspects who had been investigated and subsequently ruled out, suggesting that the focus on Bassetti was a result of tunnel vision by the authorities. After months of testimonies, arguments and deliberations, the moment of reckoning arrived. The court found Massimo Giuseppe Bossetti guilty of the murder of Yara Gambirasio and sentenced him to life imprisonment. The verdict was met with a mix of relief, shock and disbelief. While many saw it as justice served, others believed that Bassetti was a victim of a flawed investigation. The Gambirasio family, having endured years of uncertainty and heartbreak, expressed their gratitude to the investigators and the judiciary. They hoped the verdict would allow them to find some semblance of closure. The public, however, remained divided. Protests and support rallies for Bassetti emerged, reflecting the polarized opinions on his guilt. The conclusion of Bassetti's trial was far from the end of the story. In the aftermath of the verdict, new revelations, appeals, and public debates ensured that the case remained in the spotlight. The complexities of the investigation and the controversies surrounding the trial gave rise to numerous theories and speculations. 
Unsurprisingly, Bassetti's defense team quickly filed an appeal against the verdict. They argued that the DNA evidence was not conclusive and that the trial had been influenced by media sensationalism and public pressure. The appeal process led to a re-examination of key pieces of evidence. Forensic experts were once again called upon to review the DNA samples and the methodologies used in the initial analysis. Despite the defense's efforts, the appeals court upheld the original verdict, reaffirming Bassetti's life sentence. The decision was a blow to Bassetti and his supporters, but it reinforced the judiciary's confidence in the initial investigation and trial. Given the central role of DNA evidence in the case, many experts and members of the public called for a thorough and independent review of the samples. They believed that such a review was essential to eliminate any doubts about Bassetti's guilt. Advances in forensic science and DNA analysis techniques prompted discussions about retesting the evidence using the latest methodologies. Advocates argued that this could provide clearer answers and potentially identify other suspects. Concerns were raised about the potential influence of media coverage on the trial's outcome. Some believed that the constant media scrutiny had created a biased environment affecting the jury's decision. As with any high-profile case, alternative theories and speculations emerged. Some suggested that Bassetti was framed, while others believed that key pieces of evidence had been overlooked or misinterpreted. Given the continued public interest and the emergence of new evidence and theories, there were calls to reopen the case. While the judiciary resisted these demands, the possibility remained a topic of debate. The murder of Yara Gambirasio was not just a criminal case, it became a cultural phenomenon in Italy. The nation's collective psyche was deeply affected, and the case's twists and turns were closely followed by millions. The media played a pivotal role in shaping the narrative, and the public's reaction was a mix of empathy, outrage, curiosity, and skepticism. The disappearance and subsequent murder of Yara touched a nerve in the Italian populace. Parents saw their children in Yara, and her tragic fate became a haunting reminder of the vulnerabilities of everyday life. The case sparked widespread discussions about safety, trust, and the role of the judiciary. Coffee shops, dinner tables, and public squares became arenas for debates about Bassetti's guilt, the reliability of DNA evidence, and the influence of media on the justice system. From the moment Yara disappeared, the media was on the case. Newspapers, television channels, and radio stations provided daily updates, speculations, and analyses. The Gambirasio family's private grief was thrust into the public domain with every development dissected and discussed. The media's portrayal of individuals involved in the case was often polarizing. While Yara was painted as the innocent victim, Bassetti's portrayal varied from being a cold-blooded killer to a scapegoat. The narrative often shifted based on new evidence or public sentiment. The line between responsible journalism and sensationalism was frequently blurred. Some outlets were accused of prioritizing ratings over accuracy, leading to misinformation and public confusion. Italy has a history of high-profile cases that captivate the nation, from the Amanda Knox trial to the murder of Meredith Kircher. The Yara Gambirasio case was often compared to these incidents, with discussions about the role of media, public opinion, and the justice system. The case served as a reflection point for many in the media industry. It raised questions about ethics, responsibility, and the balance between public interest and privacy. The murder of Yara Gambirasio and the subsequent investigation, trial, and public reaction is emblematic of the complexities of modern criminal cases. In an era where information is instantaneously available and public opinion can be swayed with a single headline, the quest for truth becomes even more challenging. 
The case underscored the importance of forensic science in modern investigations. The DNA evidence, while controversial, played a pivotal role in identifying and prosecuting the prime suspect. Future investigations in Italy and beyond will likely place even greater emphasis on scientific evidence, given its potential to provide clear and objective insights. The intense media scrutiny surrounding the case highlighted the challenges investigators face in high-profile cases. Balancing the public's right to know with the integrity of the investigation is a delicate act, one that will continue to be a point of contention in future cases. The Yara Gamberasio case served as a stark reminder of the power of public opinion. While the courts operate on evidence and legal principles, the court of public opinion is often driven by emotions, biases, and media narratives. Striking a balance between these two realms is crucial for ensuring justice. For the Gamberasio family, the conclusion of the trial may have provided some semblance of closure, but the scars of their loss will forever remain.